we are live then yes we are live right now so we'll just uh, wait for a few people to uh, join in okay Right, so we do see a few people are joining in. So till more people come in, I'll just start with the introductions. Uh, my name is Suchishmita, and uh, I am an aspiring canine behaviorist and ethologist. I'm studying under Sindhu Pangal, uh, under uh, Barks Academy. Uh, I am currently pursuing a UK level four uh, diploma in uh, canine behavior and ethology. Um, so I have also finished my uh, foundation workshop with uh, Julia from Garland Myotherapy. And hopefully in the future, I would do a broader course and learn more about myotherapy. So we do have the Smiling Leash uh, project team with us today. We have Leticia, Ena, and Yutov. So um, could, we, uh, could you please introduce yourselves, please? OK, so I'm Leti. And I am a canine uh, myotherapist myself. I started with Julia in the UK. And I'm also a dog trainer I've, I've uh, learned from Turid Rugas. Thank you. Uh, hi. Yeah. Can I go next? Hi, I'm yes, Anna. <laughs> I am from the very small country of Slovenia, right in the middle of Europe. I am also a dog trainer and I learned from Tura Drugas just like Leti did. We were in class together, all three of us. Yes. You? Hello. Yes. yes. Hello, everyone. I'm Lubov. I'm currently based in Bulgaria, in Sofia. However, I'm originally from Russia and I'm also a dog trainer and just uh, recently finished my dog trainer education with Tura Drugas in Spain. In uh, finished in February and currently starting my uh, little practice here. Right. So uh, before we start about uh, today's agenda, which is uh, how to have a dog uh, walk on a smiling leash, could you tell us a little bit about what a smiling leash is and what the smiling leash project is all about? Um, I can take that one. Uh, okay. <laughs> so, Smiling Leash Project um, is all about showing the right thing, showing how to have relaxing walks with your dog. Smiling Leash means a loose leash. It kind of smiles. And uh, it means that the dog is comfortable and has no tension um, on it. And we, um, we usually also use harnesses so that's a big part of the smiling english philosophy using a harness so that dog is comfortable and on our pages you will find a lot of information about um, smiling english walk so how to achieve that uh, the benefits of it and also articles on other different uh, canine topics um, always connected with dog well-being and um, Ultimately, we are aiming to change people's perspective of what they think about when they think about the walk with their dogs. So we have a lot of videos, photos, and a lot of imaginary uh, images uh, to demonstrate that and to kind of bring more people on board with this Smiling English Walks. Right. And how did you uh, guys come together and start the Smiling English project? Well, okay. as I've mentioned before, we were, we were all in class together. We were learning from Tura Drugas. I know she's been mentioned before here on DogSpot. Um, Tura Drugas is an amazing expert on dog behavior, and she teaches the International Dog Trainer Education Program, uh, right. where we all met. And very near the end of our education, the second to last unit when we were expecting to actually do other things. Uh, one of our classmates, Jenny Goldsby, mentioned this term, smiling leash. And Turret heard that and she liked the term very much because it speaks about both the shape of the leash and about the feeling when you're right. working with a dog in that way. And then Turret couldn't sleep. And by the morning, she had an idea and she said, we have to do something 
about this smiling leash idea. So right. we all right away started uh, thinking about it and making videos with the dogs we had there with us and photos and kind of planning this project all at once. It all happened very quickly. I remember Luba was creating the Facebook page at the airport <laughs> when we were going home from our uh, class, our unit. And about a week later, the project was live and we started showing examples of smiling leash walks to the world. Uh, it's been, it hasn't been a year yet. It's been a little, was it half a year maybe since we started and people have started listening and looking mostly because it's very visual and responding. Everyone is sending us their photos and their videos with their dogs. And right. it's, it's a lovely, lovely, um, project and it's a good idea if you have a dog to take a look and to see um, what lovely walks you can have with your dog. Right. So I, I remember uh, Liu uh, mentioning that um, so uh, you have a long leash and you have a harness. So uh, uh, what exactly do you need for a smiling leash walk? What is the right equipment that you would suggest? Okay, so I'll take this one and then somebody can uh, feel a bit more detail. Uh, we always right. use an edge type harness, right? Okay. And so did you have a, a, maybe a, an edge type harness near you right now to show us? Not me. No. Okay. <laughs> but we'll, we'll show one in a minute, maybe we can okay. find one. Uh, okay. and it's, it's called an edge because when you look at it, it's got the shape of an H on the dog. And okay. uh, this type of harness uh, makes the dog very comfortable. It allows the dog for free movement. And uh, it is very important that the dog is able to use their body for communication. And with this type of harness, they're able to do that. And the smiling leash, which is long, we recommend only like uh, from three meters onwards three meters, five meters, it depends a bit on the situation, 10 meters. Right. And the smiling leash is always loose. Maybe you can have it a bit shorter, but always loose, always smiling, right? Because we want the dog right. to be able to be free and be, a, be able to take decisions on its own. You know, she, the, the dogs, dogs that must be able to move forward and also move back if they need to. So this length right. of the leash gives them that freedom. Okay, so you mentioned uh, a harness. So what? Uh, why? Why specifically an edge-shaped harness, and why not any other harness? We Maybe do I see can... broad-chested harnesses, and we ha see harnesses mm -hmm. which have a strap in front or going over the side. So why not those harnesses? Why specifically an edge-shaped harness? So as Letty already mentioned, comfort is very important. It's the same for us as it is for dogs. If you are in pain for any reason, more you will have more difficulties with any kind of situation. For example, imagine going to a job interview while you're in horrible pain. You won't be able to do as well and make a good impression when you're in pain. It's the same for dogs, and that's why we want them in equipment that doesn't cause any pain or any discomfort. Um, the first thing we want to protect is the dog's neck. The dog's neck is sensitive, it's precious. Uh, there are so many organs in the neck that can get easily damaged if we use equipment that puts any kind of pressure on it. So we want to avoid that. That's why we use harnesses. But as right. you said, there are so many harnesses mm -hmm. of various shapes and not all of them are good for our dogs. Uh, one of the parts of the body that really needs to be kept free of any kind of restraint is the dog's shoulder because the shoulder is only attached to the body with soft tissue. There are no bones there. They don't have a clavicle bone and the shoulder needs to be able to swing or move freely. If we constrict the shoulder in any kind of way, we are causing damage to the muscle, to the soft tissue, and the dog isn't able to walk normally. So the H-type harness leaves the shoulder completely free. Um, and of course, we don't want the harness to be 
putting pressure on anything else as well, especially the soft tissue. So in the, in the front, the harness meets in the middle at the bone, at the sternum bone. In case the dog does pull, the pressure is applied on the bone, which is much safer right. than right. if it was applied onto the soft tissue. And of course, the harness is always, always attached at the back so that the forces can be transferred properly, so that it's comfortable, so that we're not interfering with the dog's natural motion. Uh, you can see so many pictures on our Facebook page, the Smile English page, and on our yeah. Instagram. Uh, of good harnesses. They're all the same type and we've made a few posts explaining how to find the right harness for your yeah. dog, what to look for right. exactly. Mm -hmm. How to fit so, it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So while we were talking about how we need long leashes for the smiling leash walk, so about three meters. So I have a question here from one of our viewers who says that uh, my pup has started sh going for walks and he always tries to pick pick up things off the ground, which I need to prevent. So a long leash seems scary. What would you suggest? Yeah. Uh, for uh, I, I suppose this is a young puppy. Um, for right. a young puppy, it's very typical to pick up things from the ground and you know try to um, try things on the tooth as well, just out of curiosity, that's quite normal. If you are uh, not comfortable with it, try to find places where there are not as many things to pick up, but allowing your dog freedom of movement is much more important, is, is very cr is crucial, especially for a young dog. So I would say um, managing the where you are walking with your dog mm -hmm. and allowing um, the dog to explore, maybe um, allowing him um, to, to take safe objects in his mouth. We, we call this kind of set up enriched environment where you can put different safe objects for your dog. So it can you know, satisfy curiosity and um, be, you know, be curious in a safe environment. In a right. Environment. And, and would you be able to tell us why uh, long leash walking and, you know, um, uh, you know, just uh, so satisfying the curiosity of whether it's a puppy or an adult dog is necessary when it, in mm. comparison to maybe just walking the dog for a few uh, minutes and, and, you know, exercising the dog and bringing the dog back home. Yeah, because the, the, the walk is not just about walk, walking and exercising, you know, physical movement. When we need to right. think it's about the, the entire experience. The fact that the dog is engaging all their senses when they are walking, the fact that they are having a walk with you or maybe with other dogs, so it's a you know social event that they are enjoying, and also the fact that they are exercising their bodies. So you know we need to look at everything, not just exercise. Right. We always, oh, can I just add something? We always say how smart dogs are, and they really are. They are very intelligent. And we need to help them keep their brain power in a way. And that means we need to help them engage their brain on walks and otherwise. So a walk is and should be more than just marching along. Do dogs don't really need to march along. We even know that they don't really need as much movement as people seem right. to think they do. Uh, the wonderful study that you know a lot about, um, the lives of streeties, has shown us how dogs behave naturally, so without humans interfering all the time. And they don't really move as much as you would expect. Mm -hmm. But right. the and as, as Indians, uh, I mean, uh, in in this country, that's just just a huge, huge advantage that we have that we get to see free ranging dogs on the streets, living yeah. their life in their true form, not yeah. being fed on or trained on by humans, and and uh, that's a delight to see how they're curious and how their mind works. And honestly, when we go out, to, you know, just on our daily lives before the lockdown was happening. So mm -hmm. when we used to go out, we used to see that the street dogs, most of the time, for the bulk of the time, we would see them sleeping. Yes. And, yeah. and we wouldn't really see them jumping around or just being lunatics all the time. So I understand where you're coming from. Yes, a calm dog, a calm approach. Yes. 
-hmm. It's the same. Not only are they not running around like crazy, that's not something they do much. What they do is use their mind. They have to problem right. solve all the time. And our dogs that we keep as pets also need this opportunity to think, to explore, to make decisions, to solve problems. And we can do that on their daily walk. That's why we need comfortable equipment and a long enough leash so that the dog can have some space to make some decisions and investigate and explore and think so uh, i would like to have a question uh, not uh, taking on uh, what uh, letty was saying um, so uh, you said that it stimulates the senses so what exactly do you mean by taking the dog out is uh, not only about exercising the dog and uh, it also stimulates the senses well there's a lot of examples of this on our pages Basically, you need to let the dog sniff as much as possible because they understand right. the world through their nose. So right. when, when we see all these uh, dogs running along and people pulling and not letting them uh, enjoy that little moment of uh, sniffing, it's just uh, not nice for the dog and we should let them, really let them do that. But it's not just about sniffing. You can see examples on our our pages about, with every single uh, sense, you know, taste and, and being aware of their own bodies and you know hearing. We need to make sure that we give them all those opportunities, like Anna was saying. Right. And what kind way. of yes. So Liu, what kind of senses here are we talking about? So as Leti said. Um, we probably can say that sniffing is the most important sense for dogs and then allowing them on their own pace to investigate something, to sniff it, then to move on to the next object in their own pace without dragging them along is extremely important. And um, bringing them to walk on maybe different surfaces and different environments can be also very enriching for them and stimulate their brain. And when we are talking about mental stimulation through different senses, we're also talking about um, making sure the dogs have healthy brain. They are um, able to cope with different stressors in a better way when they get, you know, this different kind of simulation. Simulation, but um, always it has to be in a nice way, in the way that dog has a choice. Um, we cannot, you know, bring the dog to a very busy park and say this is a nice simulation for them. No. If the dog is um, overexcited or like running around, this is not a nice way to stimulate senses. Uh, that's why we say long leash allows dogs choices with, whether they want to move um, around, whether they want to engage in the situation or not. That's very important to allow them that. Right, right, right. And then uh, what happens if, uh, suppose, uh, it's a quite a long leash and the dog starts pulling on a long leash then? How, how does one handle that? So, yes, whenever we look at a behavior, we know that there's always a reason behind that behavior. And the best way is to eliminate the reason or change the reason and the behavior will then disappear on its own. We're not just trying to suppress the symptoms, we're working on the cause. Mm -hmm. So if we have done our homework, so our dog is wearing a comfortable harness, we have a long leash and the dog is still pulling, it might be for different reasons. It might be the environment. As we said before, some environments are very stressful for dogs. If there's a big crowd, a lot of noise, a lot of things moving around, this might be the reason. This might be too much for the dog in that moment. In that case, we try to walk in a calmer place or maybe at a time when there aren't so many different stimuli around. This might right. be one reason. There might be something inside the dog. And when I say that, I mean there might be some pain in the body, some kind of imbalance that can influence the pulling or something in terms of stress or some kind of event from their past. And we, then we go into that. Um, that makes them nervous and that makes them pull. For example, I have a dog. He has a bit of a history, a bit of a past. and. I am pretty sure he was taken away from his mother when he was too young. And one of the things right. that happens a lot with dogs like these is they uh, get nervous and afraid and stressed in new places. So right. it is 
it is likely that he will pull in a new environment because he gets overexcited, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, or maybe the behavior is learned. So maybe we have taught our dog to pull by accident. The easiest way to teach a dog to pull, don't do that, is to follow him yeah. when he pulls. And we do, we ah. make that mistake, of course. But the good thing is what is learned can also be unlearned in a nice way. Uh, okay. So if we know that our dog is not in pain, the environment is not too stressful, we've checked all the other boxes. One of the things we can do is we can teach our dog to follow us in a certain direction using a special sound. It's something that you can read about in one of the books by Tura Drugas. It's called My Dog Pulls, What Do I Do? But it's really oh, important. Yeah. It's a mm -hmm. lovely little book, but it's really important to first do all the homework. So make sure we have good equipment, make sure it's not too stressful, make sure the dog is not in pain, ta ta ta. And when you're done with all of that, then do the exercise. But with many, many dogs, you don't even need to do the exercise. Yeah. Maybe yeah. just good equipment is enough and they stop pulling and a long enough leash. And how long is long enough? Maybe <laughs> for a husky or someone. Uh, <laughs> A, a leash that's long enough for one dog may not be long enough for another. For example, three meters is good for one dog, but another might need like five meters to feel comfortable. My dog needs five or seven meters. He likes his freedom. <laughs> right. So, so uh, you were talking about you know walking the dog during a time when there is not so much of uh, not so much of stressors around or. Uh, in a calmer environment in general. So that is something a little dif difficult to find in India, especially mm -hmm. us living in uh, really, really busy cities. So uh, what would your suggestion around that be? I can take this one. I'm from Bulgaria. We also have a lot of street dogs, actually. And uh, I absolutely understand this. Um, so uh, from um, when when we are relating to a calmer time, uh, I would be looking at early morning uh, when there are not as many people or cars around, if this is what right. stresses your dog out. Or if right. you if main stressors are um, street dogs, they usually sleep during afternoon. Is it the same in India during? It, it is. It is. Yes. 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 <laughs> so I would um, I would take my dog out at that time and um, evenings as well. Um, you just really need to observe your neighborhood to um, see what stresses your dog the most. So are they cats? Are they streeties? Are these other people? And um, try to find. A, time where uh, this stressor is not as present so it really um, I can give an example so my dog is somehow very afraid of uh, elder people um, I don't know this is something oh, okay so I know that elder people like to go shopping very early in the morning so I try mm -hmm. to avoid that time and then <laughs> take her out that, yes. so you basically uh, take into place everything that your dog uh, needs and yeah. help you know help uh, to uh, present to your dog a situation where there are not so many stressors around. Exactly. Try to try to right. work around that. And uh, it might right. not be easy at the beginning, but as you observe your neighborhood, you can make like a written check boxes. You know, you can make a written plan for you. It, it will eventually work. Also, you can, if you have a, such opportunity to use a car, you could probably uh, take your dog out um, in a calm place, like a nature. Yeah. Yeah. So at Box, uh, we have we call this a sniffari. So it's yeah. like a sniffing yeah. safari for dogs. Uh, so we take our dogs out uh, on car in cars or in autos whenever we can, and yeah. we just park the city for really empty plots or you know abandoned construction sites, and we let yeah. our dog sniff Very around good. there. And nice yeah. to see how their eyes light up, and when they come back home, they're like out for a few hours yet. Yeah. So, uh, similarly, like my dog Whiskey is a little scared when it comes to sudden sounds. So just mm -hmm. now, there's wind blowing and the balcony door suddenly shut. And that's why she was sleeping and she was like, she started barking. So yeah, oh, so right. the smell is uh, during the afternoon when there are kids are sleeping or their children have just come back from school and they've, you know, had their lunch and they're sleeping. And there's, there's just not too many people around. I try to take mm -hmm. my out at that point of time of mm. course keep in mind that it can get quite hot 
in india during the afternoons mm-hmm. yes just keeping that in mind as well yes mm-hmm. so we do have a question here um from one of our viewers i let my dog walk off leash but he refuses to come back home when i call him to go home how do i get him to come home with me well uh first thing is i think we should mention that uh, dogs if he's safe and they can walk off leash is great for them because they are moving freely and right. they they are um exercising in a much more natural way if they want to do something they will if they don't they won't and there is no interference and tension from our part so that's great to let them walk off leash when we can in a safe environment and there is many many books good books written about how to teach your dog to come to you usually i would say that if you have a really really nice relationship with your dog where you go together walking and you are enjoying your time together you will have no problem whatsoever with getting your dog to come to you because it will be something that you are doing together so maybe working a bit more on the relationship that you have with your dog will be the first thing that we would recommend yeah right okay um so another thing that i was talking about when we uh, talked about sensory stimulation um other than sniffing uh, what are the other senses that can get stimulated whether if it's a, a too busy an environment like a park that you mentioned or if it's a calmer environment like an open uh, space or an abandoned construction site so what are the different kinds of sensory stimulations that you can have while walking your dog on a loose leash Well, maybe the first thing we should mention is sight, because sight, even though right. dogs are very good at sniffing and their noses are incredible, they are surprisingly visual, because it takes way less energy to see something, right? And they are especially good at detecting movement, so they see movement very well. Anything that moves, they will spot it. And of right. course. If we go to a crowded area where lots of things are going on and moving, that's a lot for a dog. It can be too right. much. Very quickly it can become overbearing and we would call this kind of situation flooding. And that's not flooding. Okay. Not, not a good thing to happen to a dog. We don't want to subject our dog to experiences that are just too much, just overbearing. So okay. all dogs are dogs they're all basically the same but there are even some breeds that have this uh, characteristic of seeing and noticing and reacting to movement even more pronounced for example collies because they had right. to use it for their work because they were taking care of the sheep and moving the sheep so Correct. if we have a dog like that i would avoid situations where lots of things are moving around or another thing we can do that works magically is to increase the distance distance is so important to dogs if something is overbearing from up close it can be okay from further away and the dog can calmly observe and learn and figure out that this thing is not as scary so one thing right. we love to do on walks and we i would recommend it to anyone is during the walk you can take a little break you stop somewhere nice we call we can call this a calm session and you just you roll up the leash a little bit so it's not like 5 meters it's about a meter and a half for example and you just stop and you leave your dog well alone so that the dog can relax and calm down and observe the surroundings so right. if you do it in this way then you're stimulating the dog's sight in a positive in a good way they like to watch right. the world go by and it's good for them as long as it isn't too much all at once right so um uh so that would be in a scena- so uh, i my uh, question here would be is it possible like uh, some uh, i mean is it possible that when a dog is very near to the stressor whatever is exciting or stressing the dog out uh, it is not only 
respect, but also uh, the smell of the person, the the sound of the person. It's just a, uh, I don't know, I don't know. It's it's a mental overstimulation in a way because all the senses uh, start working in an overdrive. Is this correct to say that that's what's happening sometimes too? Probably, but you know, sight is usually the chief one. For example, right. if you have a reactive dog. A dog that lunges and barks and and gets very upset by certain things. It can be other dogs. It can be people, whatever. Often we see that as long as this reactive dog doesn't see the trigger, they won't um, react. Right. You, right. you can have this dog listening to another dog barking and he will stay calm. The moment he sees the other dog, right. he goes calm. So yeah. even though all the senses are working, sight is often kind of the first one yes. right okay but also when we are talking about senses we really need to remember that dogs are um, made in a way that their senses are very acute so where hearing is very um, is very strong and um, they could hear things that we sometimes don't and uh, right, right. placing them in environments that are too noisy can very quickly overstimulate them or even just having their name tag on the collar on the leash making this metal sound all, all the time can also bring a lot of frustration you know you know okay. like it, it makes this sound so there are alternatives to it you could use a silicone tag or um, one made out of um a cloth so something that doesn't make a sound um also their their um touch is so also cute because you know viscous viscous on their faces right they, right they are not only there for you know just for beauty they are actually also um receptors the dogs right. uh, can use them to you know to orientate themselves in the environment and of course environment that's maybe too windy or um you know, it, there are many different uh, materials uh, laying on the ground. Walking in that area could be already overstimulating. So when we are walking our dog, we are trying to um, not overstimulate them, you know, not bringing them into too busy environment. Or if we do, giving them that break, that uh, that possibility to unwind, to, you know, to distress and uh, being very aware of that. I think um, learning and observing your dog um, to understand when it is overstimulated, it, um, right. it can be very good for you and for your relationship. There is this lovely book, again, written by Thierry Drugas. It's called uh, On Talking um, Terms with Dogs. Terms with dogs signals. Yes. yes, can really yes. help you to learn those um, signals when you can understand, okay, my dog is probably a little bit overstimulated now. We should we should go home. And it can be different things like Ina's dog, I know, starts digging before uh, when it's already too much for it. And um, my dog starts to pant, uh, breathe really heavily. And I know that that's it. We have to go home. So yeah, um, overstimulating can come from different, different um, right. sources and observe your dog. Learn your right. dog. So, so what would your suggestion be, Liu, to when uh, we already have an overstimulated dog for whatever reasons with us? Mm -hmm. so, do we not walk the dog? What do we What do we do when we have a really overstimulated, stressed dog? Uh, how do we handle that? Mm. So, not walking your dog for some time can be a solution if you have um, a safe space, maybe yard, or um, just bringing the dog for very short toilet breaks. And uh, you can engage uh, the senses and the brain in different ways at home. Um, we suggest uh, making some food puzzles, uh, even just scattering treats on the ground and allowing your dog to find them is a great way to engage uh, the brain in sniffing. Uh, there is actually a very nice study uh, on the heart rate of the dogs um, that's showing that sniffing helps them to bring their uh, heart rate down. So doing right. uh, some of that activities at home for some time can be a solution. Okay. Um, so as we were talking about how India is a very busy place and it could get quite hot, uh, could you talk? Uh, could you tell a little about how uh, walking on mm -hmm. different uh, surfaces might uh, understimulate or overstimulate or be the right kind of uh, stimulation for dogs? Okay. So 
when you're when you're walking on different surfaces, mainly what is happening is that the dog is a, a feeling and sensing through the touch all these different uh, materials, and that engages the brain, which is one of the things that we want to do on the walks. But also, if you if you um, incorporate into the walk, letting the dog choose, of course, some small obstacles, maybe a trunk, where the, you know, a, the, a tree trunk that is fall, falling on the ground and, you, and your dog wants to climb mm -hmm. over it, that is uh, um, exercise in another sense, where the dog is more aware of his own body and the muscles do send messages and signals to the brain. And it's, it's, yeah. it's the same for us, you know, it's not the, main, the same to sit like this than when we're sitting like this. It makes us feel better. We are feeling taller and we are feeling much better ourselves. And it's the same for dogs, the same message it gets to their brain. So right. incorporating this into the walk, not just walking on a straight line, but adding some curves. Maybe you can go around a tree or even a car, yeah? Making the different, different kind of moves and allowing your dog to use a step maybe just to and, go. and different natural movements yeah yeah of course yes right. Even, anything that the dog wants to do in that sense is is really positive and we should do more of that in our works yes okay so um how long what what should actually be the duration of these walks and how frequent should these walks be is, is there a difference age-wise or, you know, how small the puppy is or how, uh, I mean, if it's an adult dog or a senior dog or is it, uh, is there a difference breed-wise? How is it different for different dogs? Do you want to answer that one now or shall I? I can start and then you can go on. <laughs> okay. uh, there is absolutely a difference age-wise in how long we want to walk our dogs. I'll start with right. that. Um, okay. Puppies, puppies, they are not grown yet. They are not developed ecologically, emotionally. And we don't expect our human babies to run marathons, do we? So we shouldn't subject puppies to walks that are too long because that will cause some lasting harm. You can cause injuries that will show up later in life. And you can have different right. health health issues. And also, as we said before, the world can be quite stressful for dogs sometimes anyway. And if you're a puppy and you've only been in this world for three months, it's even worse. Puppies need a little bit of anything new and then they need a break. They need to rest, they need to sleep and process. And it's the same with walks. Uh, we usually say that we start walking puppies when they're about three months old, not before. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. their first walks are really short. They're something like 10 minutes of basically you following the puppy around. If you have to have the puppy on leash, of course, use a harness always and a long leash and just follow the puppy around. If you're in a right. safe location, you can let the puppy go off leash because usually they will stick to you anyway. Depends on where you are and how safe it is. So those right. first walks are like 10 minutes, maybe 15, and then the puppy has to go home and sleep, basically. And then right. for each month of age, we add about five more minutes. Right. And when okay. we get to about 45 minutes, that's enough. And that would also be enough for an adult dog, about 45 minutes, maybe 50 minutes, maybe an hour sometimes, or it can be less. Some dogs do better with shorter walks. If you have a very sensitive dog that gets nervous quickly, it's better to take that dog on a shorter walk or maybe two shorter walks. And besides this walk that happens once a day usually, of course, the dog needs to go out to basically eliminate and to have a sniff several right. times a day. So if we put this all together, the daily activity outside for an adult dog would be somewhere about an hour and a half up to maybe two hours all together. So one longer walk and these shorter uh, times spent outside sniffing and peeing and all that. Uh, right. For puppies, it's less. And of course, for senior dogs too. Yes. We don't expect mm. our 
grandmothers to run marathons either, and they can't. They usually have some kind of problem already with their health, so their walks should be shorter as well. Yeah. yeah. Right. And Nikki is sure to add something to what I said. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, don't. <laughs> it's fine. I, I can add right. that uh, it's, yes. it's really, <laughs> even though the time that we are saying might seem really short for other people, again, we just go um, and check out the study that uh, Sindur has done in, here in India, it's, uh, life of, Lives of Streeties, that you will see uh, how the activity is spread throughout the day if a dog is allowed to have a choice. Uh, a dog that lives a natural life so we see that it's about that anyways and of course we try to bring in our walk um, in throughout the day different types of activities so dog is allowed to you know move in the different ways and um, use their brains and other senses so right and you, so you everybody, uh, yeah sorry you no, 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 no yeah i'm gonna add something <laughs> <laughs> using their brain is, is tiring yes it's not just about exercising when we use our right. brain we get tired as well so you know right this right. is activity so it's this intense information that they gather through sight to smell through start touch working on different surfaces that when they come back home they're tired about and they have to sleep and process that information is what's happening mm -hmm. yeah exactly right and sleep is so and important sleep is very important yes and mm -hmm. why sleep is very important as you said it's basically the time where their brains are allowed to process all that information and uh, adult dog has to sleep for about 14 16 hours a day that can seem a lot to us but this is what uh, you know the science has found is right for the dog and um you know just even thinking about ourselves, if we had a bad night's right. sleep, just not enough sleep, we become, we change drastically. Our mood has changed. Our capacity, you know, at work has changed drastically. It's the same with dogs. Brain really needs that time to um, to rest, to process information, and um, to function good, to function well, and to have you know a, a good overall health. The dog needs to sleep a lot. There's right. just one well, more thing about sleep, and is right. that serotonin gets re regulated during the sleep, and that this is the substance right. that makes us feel good. So you know, like we need to allow them to sleep as much as they need, as much as, as they need, and as much they want to. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, as we are heading towards the end of the live, uh, one of the most important questions that come to my mind is, what happens? We are not able to walk our dog. Maybe it's raining. Maybe we are stuck in a lockdown where we are not able to walk our dogs. What kind of exercises or activities or mental stimulation can we do indoors uh, if we can't walk our dogs? So first of all, don't worry. <laughs> I know we're all very much conditioned to think that, okay, being a good dog owner or dog parent means walking your dog every day no matter what. No, <laughs> it's absolutely fine to skip walks every once in a while. Sometimes it's even better in some situations. But of course, we don't want to skip giving our dogs the opportunity to think, to explore, to use their brain. And we can do a lot of that at home with different brain exercises or exercises that combine the body and the brain. Uh, right. If you want to go into exercises that stimulate the brain, they usually have something to do with the nose. So we can teach our dogs different things like finding their favorite toy. We name the toy and we ask our dog to go look for that specific toy. Or very right. useful, and dogs usually like it because they feel useful, teach your dog to find your keys. I'm always losing my car keys and then I'm in a hurry and I have to get out of the house. You can put a nice big fluffy Thing, some kind of attachment to your key so that the dog can grab it easily and you can teach the dog to sniff out your key wherever it is and it's a nice exercise for the dog and it makes the dog feel proud of himself or herself uh, right. you can hide treats around your apartment or your house you can put like a treat treasure hunt 
Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's a treasure hunt. You can put right. treats and different things into a box with lots of cardboard and paper and pack it all up and give it to the dog to explore and open up and do some tearing and make a mess. They love it. There are so many, so many things you can do indoors. And you can even implement some kind of exercise. For example, using sticks that you have at home or maybe even broom handles. You can put those sticks, arrange them on the floor uh, and then scatter treats in between them. And as the dog is searching for treats, uh, it has to move its feet in a very precise manner and actually use muscles they don't use as much and they're important muscles. So they get a nice little exercise while they're searching for treats. Right. And it also probably helps balance them while they're lifting one leg up and putting yeah. their things and you know, just puts their core muscle into uh, into balance. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Um, so uh, one of the final things that I would like to discuss is how does one participate in the Smiling Leash project? Okay, you can um, first of all visit our page. You'll find some guidelines, um, like in terms of what pictures and videos uh, we are welcoming on our page. But we really would like to uh, get pictures and videos of your smiling leash walks with your dogs, and uh, we really happy to see you know dogs in different countries and different surroundings and cities and countryside and dogs of different breeds all being walked on harness H type harness and the long loose leash that's um this we will then publish on our page for other people to see and get on board with on uh, smiling leash walks and um, right. please uh, find uh, we have an email address um that the smiling leash project at gmail.com and um you can just uh, you find it also on our Facebook page and our Instagram page. Um, so please send those over. We'll be really happy to see that and uh, share it uh, on our pages. Right. So we're getting one more comment here uh, about exercises. So what what is your take on, uh, you know, uh, exercising the dog inside the house, uh, you know, while playing games like fetch or using the uh, treadmills to you know, uh, walk the dog. Hmm. Like a treadmill, you mean? Yeah, like like a human treadmill or a cardio mill, yes. Okay, like the, the treadmill is not a very good way of exercising your dog because okay. it, it, it only exercises the joints in a one direction, which is not a very natural way of moving. So the dog is always going in the same direction. And it's going, it's doing this for quite a long time. So uh, it, it can be quite repetitive and it can end up on a re repetitive uh, injury the same way that we injure our hand when we use the mouse, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> You've got company. <laughs> and the, the other thing that we, we don't like about treadmills is that there is no choice for the dog. You know, you put right. it on the, you put it there, and the dog has no way of uh, stopping the exercise. You don't know if you've right. overexercised your dog because it's, the dog is not able to tell you. And some people even tie their dogs to the treadmills, and this is quite risky. You know, you could, you could cause an injury on the dog. So, on and on, I, I, we don't recommend it. No, right. we would we would much prefer that you do some of the sensory mental stimulation uh, exercises that we've just talked about. That will be right. much more like much more enriching system. for the dog. Yeah. Yes, and uh, as we said before, walk is not just about moving; it's also about engaging all the senses and sniffing. So treadmill cannot replace that. Um, and, yeah. Uh, all of the reasons that Letty right. said and about playing fetch at home. I think it's important to mention that fetch is a very um, exciting thing. It's um, basically imitation of hunting and it really, it, uh, it trains the dog to be excited, you know, it releases a lot of adrenaline in the blood and uh, this repetitive activity with a lot of, you know, with those adrenaline rushes in the long term can bring to, um, 
chronic stress and we don't want right. that we really want to you know practice calm activities that engage the brain in a nice way um because practice makes perfect in the end you know over exciting your dog all the time will unfortunately exactly. bring right. the result that your dog will be very easy to get overexcited in other situations as right. well and we we want um the contrary we want really balanced calm individuals that are able to think process information and not you know be just hyper all the time so i think fetch um is is um, not a very nice activity to to do at home and besides right. it fetch is something that always always triggers a stress response in the dog mm -hmm. and Winky Spears was here yesterday in a live with Sindur Pangal and she made such a great point about being stressed all the time or living in a constant state of heightened stress is a terrible survival strategy and we don't want that for our dogs mm -hmm. so that's the first problem is the stress part and also fetch is not good exercise because it causes very small injuries all the time all the quick starts and stops and all the quick mm. um, like uh, changes and jumps that the dog does will cause small injuries and these things show up and mount up over time yeah. uh, and right. then you will have an older dog that is lame that can't walk properly that is in pain and becomes grumpy because of it and so on so instead of throwing that ball why don't we just take it and hide it and let the dog find it yeah. Yes, it's right. a much better exercise your dog will love it and it's much healthier in the long run mm -hmm. right. so before we end the live uh, let us talk just a little bit about uh, your workshop that you're going to be doing at the pdte <laughs> online uh, summit this year uh, could you tell us a little bit about what the smiling leash project would be doing in that workshop it's two workshops <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> One is about everything that we've talked here today, the walk, engaging all the senses and how to achieve a wonderful walk with uh, your friend. And does somebody else want to talk about the second one? Yeah, I, I could because it was my idea. The second <laughs> one is actually more geared towards dog professionals, let's say. And we were we are going to talk about building a dog friendly community on the internet, which is what we're trying to do with Smile English about what we've learned so far from starting okay. this project. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Uh, we also want to mention about the summit that it's an incredible event that we organizes this year where are so many incredible speakers. Just to name a few Mark Beckhoff and Jane Goodall are going to speak and right. um this is this is i think an opportunity not to be missed you don't have to be a pdt member to take part uh you, you can just have a dog and not even have a dog as vinky said yesterday so definitely, right. definitely um it's an open to anybody uh yeah, yeah. yeah. more convenient and than it's ever. online and you can do it yeah over exactly with it your dog travel anyway yeah, yeah. okay so if anybody has any other questions uh, or if they want to participate in the smiling leash project so i'm just flashing the uh, smiling leash facebook uh, website mm -hmm. and has their uh, email id uh, so you could uh, go have a look and their instagram hashtag is hashtag smiling leash so you could uh, contact uh, smiling leash and send in your pictures or videos there is a set uh, rules or guidelines about how what equipment it should be and how the photograph should be taken and what should and should not be done and it's not really very difficult to follow no <laughs> go have a look and send in your pictures and i think i'm gonna get a really good picture of whiskey walking on the harness and I'm gonna send you yeah. I'm very yeah. yeah yeah right so i think that's all it was okay. chatting with you it's, i think our time is nearly up too so Maybe thank you very much. September in your workshop. Yeah. That'd that be would be lovely. Yes. yes. <laughs> it was lovely talking to you. Bye. Bye. Thank, thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.